This is a lengthy section of our available DVD on the real Rio Grande Narrow Gauge Railroad back when it was a complete system, running freight trains in Colorado and New Mexico. It features the career of engineer Andy Payne and his filming of the entire line. Narration is by historian Harvey Lehner, Charles Smiley, and the late Andy Payne himself. The 483 is backed up after taking on water at the distant water tower. The 483 is ready for the next assignment. It's back past the sanding tower where we see the old sand shed with evidence of sand scattered on the ground at its base. The next few scenes feature the 483 in action with freight trains. The second train is at Arbolace. This view shows classic cut and fill type leveling construction that removes earth in the foreground to fill a valley about where the locomotive is now. Cut and fill means that little material needs to be hauled in or out with good surveying and planning. In the third scene, we see the 483 on the point nearing Durango along the Animas River. This view shows a deep cut in the rocks to provide a roadbed alongside the Animas River. All work along here was accomplished in the 1880s using lots of hand labor. This Baldwin Locomotive Works model K37 locomotive was one of 10 
built in 1902 for the Rio Grande Standard Gauge Railroad. They were originally 280 consolidation type standard gauge locomotives. Sometime around 1929, they were rebuilt as 282 Mikado type narrow gauge locomotives. The conversion required a total rebuild of the framework below the boiler. This because the new 44 inch diameter drivers were mounted on a narrower 36 inch spacing for the narrow gauge rail operation. Also, the counterweights that balance the driving rod's mass were moved to the outside of the driving wheels. For balance and support, rear 28 inch diameter trailing wheels were added under the cab and firebox area. day of fall, September 23, 1966, Rio Grande Extra 493, coming west, Donnie Gibbs running and Felix Lucero firing. We'll first pick her up at Arboles, Colorado on the constructed track. We prepared this map to show the Rio Grande narrow gauge lines in blue. The yellow lines represent the important Rio Grande standard gauge lines in this general region. A separate narrow gauge line called the Rio Grande Southern ran from Ridgeway down to Durango. That line ended in 1953. The Rio Grande standard and narrow gauge trains ran on three rail dual gauge track or a substantial distance of over 28 miles from Alamosa down to Antonito. 
Also, a few small sections up in Salida were dual gauge until the Rio Grande narrow gauge was removed entirely in 1955 from Salida to Montrose. As we watch Andy's earliest movies of the Grand, this is a good time to provide an overview of the history of the railroad in these parts. In the 1880s, General William Palmer was building the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad. Looking for revenue sources, he put feelers out in three different directions that had the potential to grow his railroad's business. One was west through the Royal Gorge to the mines near Leadville, Colorado. Another was south to Santa Fe, New Mexico. The third branch was west from Alamosa to the base of the San Juan Mountains at Anima City to tap the developing gold and silver mining activity some 45 miles to the north at Silverton, Colorado. The San Juan extension, as this line became known, was built on a tight budget. The risk-reward ratio was iffy at best. With a lot of sharp curves on poorly graded right-of-way, construction of the narrow gauge route progressed westward from Alamosa over Cumbres Pass through Chama towards the San Juan area. By August of 1881, 200 miles of railroad were completed in a little over a year. Anima City was to be the natural location for the railroad's hub at the western end of the San Juan extension. But city officials refused to provide free land to Palmer for the railroad's facilities, so he decided to build them a few miles south of Animus City, naming the new railroad facilities location Durango. It didn't take long for the new town of Durango to become the commercial center for the area. As the result, Animus City lost a significant economic opportunity. Though Durango itself promised little revenue generation, it became the hub for transporting the products of the silver and gold mining industries around Silverton. But more on that later. The 464 is switching cars here. It uh, broke a driver box two weeks before I hired out. So that was the end of it, huh? That was the end of it as far as the Grand was concerned. Of course, it's running today. on the San Juan, do you know? The oh, train? yeah, at one time they'd all have been used on that. Here's a passenger train coming in from Silverton. Coming into Durango. So, yeah, it's a mixed train. So this was the regular, pa this was Yeah, this, that would be, that would be, yeah. Operating as a mixed train. It was always legally a mixed train. Did it operate only on Wednesdays? I have an official guide that says that it only Oh, on no, Wednesdays. it was operating in 54. It was operating every day in right? the summertime. Andy was hit hard by the narrow gauge bug. He returned to further explore and film this newfound passion a few months later in August of 1954. His return trip to the narrow gauge included filming at several locations along the San Juan extension from Alamosa to Durango. He began the westward trek in Alamosa filming a dual gauge freight train operating between Alamosa and Antonito. Okay, here's the standard gauge. Yeah, they just, they, could, they couldn't go any further than Antonito, of course. There's your idler cars. Right, there's... The narrow gauge caboose. Okay, so this is Alamosa to Antonito. Yeah. That's as far as the third rail went. Uh, 
Now this is down around Romeo. Next, Andy focused on the portion of the San Juan extension between Lobato and Windy Point, just below the summit of Cumbres Pass. Now, as a practice, the, the Cumbres and Toltec never runs two locomotives uh, coupled together or, uh, on this bridge. Yeah, so was, you're right, right. Was that a DNRGW practice yeah, as well? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, same, the, the same thing. This was supposed to be a separation of so much. Oh yeah, it was sawmill in Chama, uh, it was a sawmill down in Navajo, or a sawmill in Durango. Windy Point, that's where your 4% is. This is getting near the top. Now this is, see, the old road, the old dirt road had a different uh, configuration than the paved road does today. They didn't follow exactly the same place. I see. Traveling west to Durango, Andy filmed the westbound at Azotea, 10 miles west of Chama at milepost 354. Azotea. Uh-huh. 
That would be two stations west of Chama. That means flat roof. It, uh, the station is not a building. The station is a place on the railroad designated in the timetable. After the flat car, you will see a 9600 series pipe gondola. It came from an obsolete 20-piece group of standard gauge boxcars that were cut down in 1953 to become pipe hauling narrow gauge gondolas. The flat cars here were typical of many wood frame cars that had steel track rails clamped on their sides to reinforce them for heavier duties. Another 9600 series pipe gondola can't hide where the old boxcar door was before the conversion. This Baldwin Locomotive Works K36 model was one of 10 built for the Rio Grande in 1925. Four of these, including number 483, were equipped with steam lines and signal lines in the 1930s to accommodate pulling passenger trains. The others were used as freight and helper locomotives. two-way two-wheel arrangement was favored by the Rio Grande narrow gauge for road power. This included the other classes such as the K27s, K28s, and the K37s. These were all referred to as Mikados in the U.S. That Japanese name started when Baldwin built a batch for a Japanese narrow gauge railroad back around 1897.
The eight driving wheels and their large diameter would crowd the space for the firebox if this was a simple 280 design. So the smaller diameter trailing wheels allow for a wider firebox to improve steam supply and they support some of the weight of that part of the locomotive. Like most of the Rio Grande narrow gauge power, these have 2 a 2 wheel arrangements. The middle four axles were powered by connecting driving rods and a pair of steam pistons. The boiler pressure was 195 pounds per inch. Nine of these, except number 485, are still in use on tourist lines. Number 485 was scrapped in 1955 after it rolled into the Salida turntable pit. Number 483 here has the distinction of powering the last passenger train from Alamosa to Durango. Who's this guy? Yours truly. Ah, okay. Was this in your hostler's days? Yes, yeah, yeah. Now, when you were uh, hustling an, an engine, did you do everything? Did you bring the locomotive out of the roundhouse, get it over to the coal tipple and the uh, water tank? And okay, the first thing is, uh, the hostler's job, the first thing is duty is to move engines around you know, the yard. Operating that, that turntable. Oh, well, that's air operated. See, there's air lines that go in there, and then a the ball joint, of course, you know, it connects in the middle, and there's air motor on that. Is the air source from the roundhouse or from yeah, the Yeah, yeah, that was a uh, compressor inside the roundhouse, alongside the roundhouse. What he's doing is just the directional, the lever is directional and the, it's just a regular ball valve you could throttle it with. Then uh, you go to all this other stuff is uh, local uh, agreements, like, you know, uh, helping the uh, washing out the pans while the uh, hustler helper is uh, cleaning the fire and stuff like that, spotting the engine so you can get coal, water, and sand, etc., and uh, putting it in the roundhouse. If a machinist comes out and he wants the engine spotted for some reason, why uh, a certain way why you do that. That's it, kettle. That's my helper.
And what's he doing there? They call clean, cleaning the fire? Well, or? he's shaking the grates there, as you can see the motion. And yeah, we clean the fire, get the clinkers and uh, all the ashes out. And he's got the hook in there now. You pull a group of your good fire, your live fire, into one one portion, and then you uh, work your uh, ashes and clinkers and cinders and stuff out some, in another portion. And then is there and a then, then spread it back. And you now this engine that has the very back there is a drop grate. Uh, what you can do is uh, open a drop grate and pull uh, pull clinkers and stuff like that uh, right out through it directly or else you can uh, build your fire, uh, put your good fire in another position and drop your uh, ashes out. So here we're still doing some more Yeah, some more this is more hustling scenes. Yeah. You, 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 like in Hollywood, you go out and you shoot it and you shoot it and you shoot it yeah. and then you print the first one. <laughs> what are you hosing down here? Oh, washing out the ash pan while he's cleaning the fire. So when you clean the fire, you don't dump the whole fire, right? Not unless you want to kill it, you know. So let the engine cool down and that's yeah. it, right? Well, if you, if you got it once every 30 days, you got to go in for a boiler washout and all that, you know, and then of course you just dump it, you kill it. Okay, but in this case, you separate out the good fire from the cinders and the, the bad Ooh, yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, right. And then drop it through the grates and hose it down while it's coming out. Is that yeah, you know, when it the drops pan? into the pan, the pan has got to cover the uh, every, uh, underneath everything, uh, the grates. Yeah. Because you don't want to be going along uh, out the right of way and dumping. Where'd you get that hat? Cromer. We got a whole bunch, all us guys got a whole bunch of caps, we're getting them all. One guy show up with one, and he's just like a bunch of Canucks, one of them <laughs> buys something or everybody else has to have a, one like it, you know. I think this is a great scene. Now Hank Phillips took this and uh, I just gave him my bowl accent to use and he was uh, taking pictures. And Hank Phillips was a friend of mine. I was, was running the engine. Order? Well he was at one time. He was a fireman one time. But, uh, but you're running this engine now, right? Yeah, right. There were two uh, gondolas with coal. Yeah, right. Was that strictly for the locomotives? Uh, yeah, there's a, well, they load, there was a dock that was down below. There was a place where the trucks would come from the mine and dump the, uh, uh, just back up on this dock and dump coal in the guns. Then they'd uh, haul it with the guns and uh, we'd spot it up on, on the, behind the coal chute. Oh, they had the buckets. You so know. you mean they trucked the coal into Durango and transferred it to the guns? Just, yeah, just well, to bring that's, it over that's, to that that's, track. That's, can you, how else are you going to put it in a locomotive when all you got is the coal chute? No, I just thought that the uh, gondolas with the coal came in from uh, now Salida or from, you know, somewhere. No, no, right there in the mines just west of Durango. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, that was good coal, Durango coal. But uh, the select coal went to the <laughs> high priced customers. I mean, the. Real Grand was buying it for coal for three dollars a ton in these years. They got what was left, mine run coal. Mine run coal is just as it comes out of the mine, it's not graded. And that's what this is? That's what they used yeah, Oh yeah. And now we're spotting up here behind. Now how'd they get the coal up into the, up into the uh... Well they had the buckets that ran up and down. See where the smoke is? Yeah. Well there was, uh, there's uh, buckets that went up and down. They were just a straight winch, you know, and they 
Then when they got to the top, why there was guys, rollers and stuff to dump them into the chute. You smoking a pipe? Oh yeah, a long time ago. Oh, okay. Who's the trainman with the cowboy hat? Oh, that's uh, Freddie Pollock. He's a switchman. He was he was a farmer and the rest of the year and when the trains were running, I come down and work as switchman. In closing this topic, we have a conversation between Andy and Harvey about the benefits of watering the coal as it falls from the coaling tower's coal chute into the locomotive's tender. It looks like he's watering. Look, as the, as the yeah. coal's coming down, he's spraying, yeah. spraying it with a hose. Yeah. Keep the dust down. Yeah. Right. And another thing, a lot of times coal will burn better if it's wet. A lot of people don't understand that. I'm one of them. Explain that. Why is that? Okay, now that hill back, back of Durango, Smelter Mountain, over on the other side of it, on the west slope of it, there's an abandoned coal mine. Every now and then it catches on fire. Volunteer fire chief, you know, of course that was county territory, said, you want to come with me? We got a fire burning up at the old Durango mine. So anyway, he says, it's starting to rain. He says, maybe it'll help put the fire out. And I says, uh-uh, it'll make it burn better. You see what, you've got sulfur, almost all coal, various other components, and the water mixes with a lot of that stuff. And then you get flammable gas, see, when it gets hot, and that makes it burn better. Look for the entire story on our DVD available on our website at www.cspmovies.com. Be sure to like and subscribe and thanks for watching.